This morning, uh, I'm going to preach to you from the very bottom of my heart. I want to preach to you about the subject, someone tell me the truth. Someone tell me the truth is the title. I'm preaching on this subject because I do not want to see the United Pentecostal Church of Australia sell itself out. We do have a testimony of what God has done and what he's going to do. We have a testimony because we have a message and we have the truth. The world is absolutely crying out for truth. Every one of us want to know truth. Except, and Sister Hogman would know this, sometimes we're afraid of the truth. We're afraid to pick up that telephone when we know that somebody in our family is on their deathbed. Sometimes we're afraid to go to the doctor and receive a report because uh, the truth is going to hit home pretty heavy. But that's not the sort of thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about knowing the truth. We're not interested in becoming another denomination. We won't inherit eternal life just by belonging to a denomination. God said of Israel, I didn't choose you because you were a great nation. I didn't choose you because you were strong. He said, I just chose you, so don't be proud about it. In fact, he chose Israel. A lot of people think, well, why was Israel so special? They were special. They were the priestly tribe. They were the ones that were to go out into the world and to reach all mankind with the gospel, with the way of salvation. But they failed and then God had to rise, raise up a, a priestly tribe within them to keep them on the tracks. You see, truth is very, very important. And this morning, I'm going to read, to begin with, a scripture that is very well known to you. You probably might even have to look it up. It's in the book of John, chapter 14. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, I am the way, and I am the truth. I am the way. There is no other way, that means. I am not just one of the ways. I am the only way. And he says, I am the truth. The only truth. Another verse in the Bible is found in the book of Proverbs. Chapter 23, verse 23. There it says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth. Everybody say that. Buy the truth. Buy the truth. Not just have the truth. Buy it. And sell it not. Now, Pilate wasn't a godly man. He was a, po a political ruler. We know much about him in regard to the judgment of Jesus. And during that judgment, Pilate was calling witnesses before him as well as speaking unto Jesus. And Pilate eventually said, regarding Jesus' uh, judgment, he says, What is truth? What is truth? And a lot of people are asking that question today. Somebody, please tell me the truth. Pilate says, what is truth? Well, in actual fact, he already knew what the truth was with regard to his responsibilities. Because after he judged Jesus, he used these words. He said, I find no fault in him. That's where it should have finished. He was the judge. He was the man to make the decision. He said, I find no fault in him. So, 
we find here behind these words that Pilate is being torn. He's being torn between a political situation, I suppose we could say, and what he knew to be the truth. He was the judge. He knew there was no fault in Jesus, and he made that statement to them. And so in his, in his state of being perplexed, he said, what is true? Because I, I suppose in that he was saying, look, I've got a dilemma on my hands here. I'm being torn between politics and what I know is the truth. He found no fault in Jesus. But he allowed it to be a compromising situation. In John chapter 19, in verse 12, it says, And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Then in Matthew 27, 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See to it. He thought by washing his hands, and, and today people go to psychologists and psychiatrists sometimes, and I'm not saying that is always the that is always bad. But what I am saying is when you know what you should be doing, those people can't help. There are many, many people who are troubled in this world because they will not do what is right. They will not obey the truth. Even if people find themselves in serious sin, our God provided a way out. I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. There is forgiveness with Jesus. And I believe anybody who will go back to the Lord can be released and set free in the wonderful liberty that he offers. Forgiveness, freedom of mind, as was said this morning in the interpretation. Peace that passes all understanding. And so Pilate was the judge and he compromised. He felt just by washing his hands that the situation may somewhat be relieved of him. But this was the attitude that put Jesus on the cross. Compromise. The attitude that put Jesus on the cross was compromise. In the Bible, none of us are just, none of us just have to take notice of man. None of us have to get involved in a compromising situation. I've heard of preachers who say, say I'm the man of God. You do what I tell you. That's not right. Any man who says that is not a man of God. This is what tells us what to do. And if you don't understand it, search it. Search it with all your heart until you find out the truth. Because that's the way that organisations have gone when men have stood up and they've had their various ideas and they've said, you do what I say. We have the word of God and the Bible says to Timothy, and sure, he was a pastor. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Today we have the great privilege of being educated. The vast majority of us have a reasonable education. And not only that, we are very privileged to have a copy of the word of God. Don't just leave it gathering dust. If you're not going to read it, put it in the post and send it somewhere where somebody will read it. 
because literally millions and millions and millions of people around this world don't have their own Bible to read. When we go into third world countries, we always come up against people. Could you please give me a Bible? Could you please give me a Bible? I was uh, in India once and I had a Bible and, uh, and, and I, I noticed that somebody didn't have a Bible and I got talking to them. Well, I noticed they didn't have a Bible after I got talking to them. And, and I was carrying this old Bible with me. And when I gave them that Bible, to this day, that person still has that Bible because they didn't have a Bible. And how they love that Word of God, how they care for that Word of God, how they keep that Bible wrapped up so that it doesn't get deteriorated in the dust and the heat and the humidity. They love their Word of God because they didn't have it. And you have it. What are you going to do with it? It goes ahead and, and that scripture that I read and says also, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Wisdom is good sense. It is not common sense. Common sense is common to everybody. But we as God's children have good sense because we take our sense from the word of God. So it says to seek wisdom. It says instruction. This is an unusual word here because when I looked at it uh, in the Hebrew, it actually means chastise. In other words, that we should buy instruction, buy chastisement. Because if we're chastised, we, we can be corrected. You leave a child to itself, what is it? It becomes wayward. It also says that we should seek after understanding, which is knowledge, which will lead to wisdom. I was once talking to somebody and, uh, and in the midst of the conversation, they thought, well, I thought truth was whatever you wanted to make it. Now that, that shocked me, but I've since learned that's the general idea of most people. Truth is whatever you want to make it. It's whatever you want to believe. But that is not God's standard of truth. Because that's saying the truth is not certain. To others, like Pilate, truth was popular opinion. It is not popular opinion. Broad is the way that leads to distraction. Straight is the way that leads unto eternal life. That tells me that there are not many going to heaven. The Bible tells us that when we know truth, we have peace. That was the word this morning. Buy the truth. Buy it. Buy it at any cost. Be willing to part with anything. Be willing to part with your relatives. Be willing to part with your children. Be willing to part with your job. Be willing to part from your neighbours. Be willing to part with your wealth. Be willing to part with everything because there is nothing as precious as Jesus and he is the truth. I want to tell you when it comes to everlasting life, truth is never too expensive. We should be willing to part with our pleasures, our popularity, our riches and the things of this world. Buy. In other words, purchase it upon no other terms than the very fact that you've got to have it. We have a good example of that in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, talks about the pearl of great price. A man was seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. He sold everything that he had for one pool. He was a merchant man. I would say that he probably had a lot of other pools. But he sold all of his other pools and all of his other wealth just so that he could have that one pool of great price. And that pool is Jesus. And Jesus 
is the truth. Why am I keep on saying Jesus is the truth? Because you can't have Jesus when you've only got half the truth. Well, I, I, at this point, I was tempted to lead off in a certain direction and start because my heart is really in everybody knowing God here this morning in a truthful way, not just my type of religion. My heart is that people will find true gospel salvation, not denominational salvation. So I'm going to just rest at having to tell you that you... The gospel of salvation is you've got to know who God is. He just can't be something fuzzy out there that nobody really knows. You've got to know who he is. Because unless you know who he is, you don't know what he wants you to do. Buddha wants one thing. Other gods want other things. So, are you going to choose a little bit of this and a little bit of that? Maybe listen to your friends and neighbours about their opinions of what they will tell you about God and how to find him? I don't think so. There's only one truth. And brothers and sisters, what I'm saying here this morning, the United Pentecostal Church of Australia has to be hungry for this truth. Hungry. Hungry and thirsting after righteousness. One of our, uh, one of our brothers, I think he might be in America, I just read in an article, and it was very interesting because he was talking about, um, about the truth about water. And it was a, an interesting thing. So I, uh, I went and, uh, and did a bit of an investigation. So uh, he was saying that you Google the truth about water. Uh, it would be amazing. So I did that. And uh, I found such things as the untold truth about water, the water you drink the shocking truth about water, the plain truth about water, is it safe to drink water? <laughs> and then another one, if you, uh, everything you wanted to know about water but didn't know who to ask. <laughs> Bottle water versus tap water, tap into the truth about water, and the undiluted truth about drinking water. And it just goes on and on and on and on. You know, this is a popular subject. There are 80 million sites on the internet about the truth about water. So that just tells you one thing. People are looking at trying to find out what the truth is. But this is only the truth about water. 80 million. So, uh, and then Brother Kelly, uh, in his article, he said uh, about uh, taking one step further, and that is how many people are interested in the truth about God. Well, there was an astounding number of 52.5 million hits when I typed in the truth about God. Compared with 80 million, the truth about water. Astonishing, isn't it? Well, water is a very good illustration about the truth. And um, I need a helper here this morning, and uh, I think you're going to be a good helper, Matthew. If you come up here, just stand here at the front, just just for now, Matthew. Matthew, just down here, please. <laughs> All right. Let's see. It's an illustration, but I hope it will strike home to you. You know, I, I bought some water up here this morning and uh, as soon as people saw water, they started helping themselves to it. <laughs> I, bought a, I bought a bag of it, so I ended up with four. So the ushers, if the ushers are back there, could you find me about three or four more bottles of water? Okay, just come over here, uh, Matthew, if you wouldn't mind, please. Uh, would you like to just uh, pour that? Okay, just open the first one. Thank you, brother. Yep, just put, did uh, you break the seal? Yep. Yep, pour it in. Let's go to it. Another one. I broke the seal on that one.
Okay, anybody thirsty this morning? All right, brother and sister Maya, please come and help yourself here. Just pour them out uh, a cup of water there, Matthew, if you wouldn't mind. Anybody else like a drink of water? All right, sister, please come. That's it. Anybody else? Yeah, you can come. Yeah, there's water here. It's not very often you come to church and the pastor's offering uh, water, is it? <laughs> okay, we might not have enough cups here. But uh, when you've drunk your water, just, just stay here. All right, thank you very much. Here we are. Drink it all. Anybody else? There we are. Yeah, brother. There's this opportunity. I mean, if you're thirsty, buy up every opportunity. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy up every opportunity. When you're thirsty, you know, you'll drink anything. <laughs> anybody, uh, anybody else? Uh, come, brother. Good news. All right. I've got two. Yes, here, sister. There we are. All right. I need, uh, I need uh, somebody behind the platform there to help Matthew now. Just uh, put it up there, please, Matthew. Uh, Matthew is going to go up on the platform. In the back of the platform here is a toilet. Uh, I'm not asking him to bring me back a teaspoon full of water. I only want him to dip that in the bowl and bring it back. Whichever way you want to go, yeah, that's fine. Are you enjoying this water? <laughs> we haven't done any of that yet. Yeah, we, they were, we broke the seals, okay? We broke the seals. So uh, uh, we're, we're depending upon the brand name. <laughs> By the way, if you ever go to India, you never check the seal on the top. You always check the seal on the bottom. Because they poke a hole in it, squirt the good water out, then put the bad water in and seal it with a hot iron. And then you get very bad stomach problems. So the best thing if you're ever in India or places like that is boil your water. Never trust bottled water. Okay. That's been in the, in the toilet, hasn't it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, just pour some more water in that jug. Just break those seals. You know, many, many times... We think a little bit of a little bit of untruth won't matter. And on this spoon are germs, no doubt. They will only probably give you a stomach ache for twenty four hours, maybe at the worst forty eight hours. You may have to go to the doctor and have some antibiotics or something or other if it really gets bad, but the chances of you dying of the germs on this spoon are pretty slim. I think you're getting my message right away. How are we going, Matthew? All right. Okay. Okay. Well, I've got a whole jug here for anybody who wants it. Uh, have I made my point? Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give him a clap. We'll compromise and take a little bit of untruth and live our life on it but a little bit of untruth will send you to eternal hell not just a hospital popular opinion you can make the truth whatever you want to 
But I'm telling you that if you don't hold to the truth, then you're going to go the way you don't want to go eternally. Come on, preachers. It's not about popularity. It's not about numbers. Jesus never compromised numbers for truth. We have a Bible school where you can study truth, you can study the Bible. But yet somehow up here, we would never pollute our bodies. And you notice, I didn't have a spoonful, I just dipped it. If you know anything about concentrations, that means, really, to tell you the truth, the amount of bacteria that probably got in that water would never hurt you. But you still wouldn't touch it. But yet we compromise, all for the sake of relatives, all for the sake of friends, all for the sake of my own ideas, we compromise truth. Truth about God, truth about what God wants us to do, truth about the way of salvation. If I get baptised, then my whole family will reject me. But pastor, I've been baptised before. It may have not been the right way, but I've actually been baptised before. Well, we need to seriously consider it. I've done this illustration here this morning to show you how we compromise. We won't drink the water which will only affect us for a short period of time. But maybe we'll digest things that are not truth. The world out there is not interested in truth. They're interested in li just living this life however they can. I'm finishing. I just want to talk about the desire for numbers. I believe God brings revival. There's nothing holds people in the church better than truth. Quite a number of years ago, I was at the hardware and I saw a, a bottle there um, it was advertising a new type of weed killer. And uh, I'd heard a little bit about it and having been a chemist myself, I was really interested in this because it was just called herbicide. Herbicide. And herbicide is a hormonal weed treatment. And when I got to know about this herbal side, <coughs> herbicide, I learned that when you put it on the plant, it grows fast. It puts a hormone into the plant that causes that plant to grow very, very fast. The only trouble is, the growth is also the death of it. Because it grows so fast, it can't be nourished. It still can't absorb those vital ingredients. Now I know the analogy breaks down, but don't think that growing a fast church and having a big church is the answer. Only the truth is the answer. I'm finishing, and this is very, very important. When it comes to truth, there are three generations, and I want every single person to listen to this. When I came into Pentecost, I had to dig it out myself. I didn't have a preacher to preach it for me. I heard about it. But I had to get this Bible, and I had to pour through this Bible 
for many, many years. In fact, when I first started off, I spoke against Pentecost. This preacher used to preach against Pentecost. Why? Not because I read it in the Bible, but I read some books about these dreadful people who climb the walls and roll all over the floor and, and jabber and uh, speak in other tongues. And, and that didn't sound common sense to me. So I became an expert and people invited me to go and talk about my knowledge about these demon-possessed Pentecostals. The only trouble was that while I was doing that, their yearning set up in my heart to find out what was the, real, the truth because the more I tried to do that, the more I wanted to know what the truth was. And so I began to search in the Bible and I found the truth. I found the truth about God. Not easily. I found the truth about salvation. Not easily. And then I had to leave the people who loved me the, the big church with all the programs. I didn't come into the United Pentecostal Church straight away. But I still had a hunger for truth. I used to meet with a friend. And for one night every week, we prayed that God would lead us into truth. One night every week. And he did. To tell you the truth, I really didn't know which way he was taking us because I didn't know all the truth at that particular time. But there was a hunger and a thirsting. And you see, when you cut this out for yourself, when you get hungry for it, and you really want to know God, and you really want to know what's right, you take possession of it. And when you know it, you will not turn to the right, you will not turn to the left, you will not compromise. And so the first generation are they that know God because they found him according to the word of God. And then there are others the next category, by the way, they, that first bracket are, are marked by commitment. The second generation are those who hear what their parents say. Secondhand stories about the mighty works of God. They set their values on what their mother and father tell, you, tell them, because, or their grandparents, because they knew God. They know their, their, their parents and their grandparents knew God. And so... They go along with that sort of leadership. But it does tend that people in that category do what's right in their own eyes. Because it's not their experience. It was their parents' experience. It's a type of fast food religion. Don't read your word of God. Just listen to what mum and dad say. And those wonderful stories that your parents told you, because you don't have that relationship with God yourself, then you don't see those same things in your life. And so there's this, this myth there. Is God real? Is, is this all fantasy, what my parents talk about? And so there's compromise. The third generation, after mum and dad and then the children and then there's the grandchildren, and I have grandchildren, is the generation that knew not their God. They were so far removed from the truth that was actually dug out of the word of God that they know not their God. Their parents are compromisers. And they slide even further into disillusionment and conflict and they certainly do what is right in their own eyes. That second category really I suppose we should have said they do what's right in their parents eyes but the final category only does what's right in their own eyes.
There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I'm finishing. Because it's time. But I'm not finished with praying for you as a church. I know this is a challenge. Men and women have laid down their lives for this truth in centuries past, in millenniums past. Men have given us the word of God and there's corrupted versions of this word of God. What's the solution? We need to get back into the Bible. We need to get on our knees. Because if you're not reading God's word and searching God's word, you will never know the truth. And if you're never on your knees, then how can you listen to the way that God wants to lead you? Are you going to compromise? You didn't compromise this. None of those folk up here compromise this and I don't blame them. But there's something far more important. It's your eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the only way. I am the truth and the life. If you're only serving the United Pentecostal Church of Australia, you're only serving an organisation. That organisation may hold to truth, but you're only serving an organisation. And an organisation cannot find you a place in heaven. You may have a pastor who preaches the truth, but you have to find it for yourself. You've got to possess it yourself. Buy the truth. Spend hours in the Word of God. Don't go telling people how to be saved if you don't know how to be saved yourself. Don't go telling people the way when you're compromising yourself. Now I know there's weakness in every one of us and the devil would condemn. But I think we know when we're full on and when we're not full on. Maybe there are some here this morning that want to make a definite commitment today. Put a line in the sand and say, I want to serve God with all of my heart. I don't want to compromise. Lord, bring me back to the word of God. Bring me to my knees. The health of our organization does not depend upon Pastor Downs or any of the elders. It depends upon how we handle the truth. Amen. I invite you to come to this altar. There will be those who will pray with you. We're not saying that anybody, everybody comes out here is, uh, is somebody who doesn't believe the truth. If you come and kneel at this altar, you're really saying, I want to do my best for God. Amen. That's my word to you. I believe I heard from God. Thank you.